Good afternoon. Warm greetings to each and every one of you. My name is Roni Kainka, and I will be the master of ceremony for today's webinar. First and foremost, I would like to welcome our respected guests from Basel Institute on Governance, Ms. Claudia Baez Comargo, Head of Public Governance at the Basel Institute on Governance. Mr. Jacopo Costa, as a senior researcher at the Basel Institute on Governance. And Kang Rehan Fahri, as our beloved alumni who is now working at the Basel Institute on Governance. Now, I would like to welcome Bapak Widya S. Sumadinata, as the respected dean of FISIP, and Ibu Widya Ningsi, as well as Bapak Benny Alexandri, as respected vice deans of FISIP. Welcome, respected boards of managers and heads of study programs at FISIP UNPAD and fellow students. Today, the Faculty of Social and Political Sciences, in collaboration with the Basel Institute on Governance, present to you a webinar, Good and Clean Governance, Challenges and Opportunities. Joining with us today, our respected speakers and moderator, Ms. Claudia Baez Comargo, respected head of public governance at the Basel Institute on Governance as the first speaker. Mrs. Mudiati Rahmatunisa, respected head of the political study master program at FISIP UNPAD as the second speaker. And Mrs. Fiani Puspitasari as our moderator. Before starting the webinar, I would like to call upon Bapak Widya S. Sumadinata as the respected dean of FISIP UNPAD to give a welcoming speech. Papa Widya, the time and place is yours. Okay. Dr. Claudia and Mr. Jacob Costa, right? Ibu Dr. Mudiati Rahmatus Nisa, Ibu Viani, Profesor Nandang, uh, our Vice Dean, Pak Beni, uh, our Manager, Bu Erna, uh, Pak Arif, uh, students, ladies and gentlemen, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Firstly, I would like to thank to uh, Dr. Claudia and uh, Mr. Jacob for uh, accepting our invitation to give uh, a lecture today for our students. And the topic is about uh, the challenges and opportunities for uh, tackling uh, uh, corruption in Indonesia. As we know that uh, until today, corruption is still as a hot issue in our country. So we have to find the best uh, the best ways to take uh, to uh, to, uh, to to take down the corruption in our uh, country so i think it is a very good opportunity to us for students and our faculty to to have uh, insight for uh, from uh, dr claudia for basel institutes and then uh, thank you to pa fahri for facilitating uh, this event today. And I hope uh, the audience uh, have to enjoy uh, the, uh, the, the, the lecture today. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Bapa Widya, for the warm welcoming speech. Now, let me introduce a little further of our moderator. Mrs. Fiani Puspitasari is a lecturer in International Relations Study Program, Faculty of Social and Political Sciences, Universitas Pajajaran. She has been working as a lecturer since 2006. She is also a researcher at Center for International Security Studies in the same department. Her interests comprise of issues concerning Indonesia's foreign policy, global political economy, public diplomacy, food security, as well as the South of cooperation. 
As we get to know more about our moderator, I see so many faces being super excited to listen to her as well as our respected speakers. So, without further ado, let's start the webinar and let's all welcome our moderator, Mrs. Fiani Puspitasari. The stage is yours. Okay, thank, thank you, you Master of Ceremony, Inca, for giving me uh, the opportunity. Good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I'm very pleased to be here today. Uh, welcome to the hybrid uh, seminar on good and clean governance, challenges and opportunities. And this seminar is brought to you by Faculty of Social and Political Sciences, Universitas Pajajaran, in collaboration with the Paisal Institute. I'm Fiani Puspitasari, the faculty member of Faculty of Social and Political Sciences, um, Pajajaran University, and also a researcher at Center for Security and International Studies, Fisi Pajajaran University, and I'm the moderator of this hybrid seminar this afternoon. Well, um, ladies and gentlemen, good and clean governance is an issue that arises in the management of public administration. And uh, this is reflected, among other things, the intense demand from the community to state administrators, both in the government, the representative council, and the judiciary to organize good governance. This demand doesn't only come from the Indonesian community, but also from the international community. The Sustainable Development Goals declared by the United Nations call out the need for clean and good governance in order to make society's well-being as the top priority come into being. However, many countries still have been struggling to address the problems of corruption, law negligence, and conflict of political interests not exception the developed countries, and they are still entangled by these problems and also our country as well. And today we will uncover the challenges and opportunities of good and clean governance and discuss further how to adopt the good and clean governance. And we are very grateful because we have two uh, um, panelists, yeah? And uh, we have two panelists today. The first panelist is Ms. Claudia Vice Camargo, and she is Head of Public Governance at the Basel Institute on Governance. And the second panelist is Mrs. Mudiati Rahmatunisa, Chair of the Political Science Graduate Program, Faculty of Social and Political Science, Universitas Pajajaran. And I call the two panelists to come forward to this place. Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, before we, get, we are getting started, um, I'll meet the curriculum vitae of each today. The first panelist is uh, uh, Will you uh, please help me uh, showing the uh, the caption for this? Or okay, okay. For the first time, we have Termudiati Rahmatunisa. <laughs> okay, still, we still have here. Yeah, for the first uh, panelist today, okay, it's not so clear. Okay, wait a moment. Wait a moment, please. Yeah, I still have a problem here with my computer. <laughs> Excuse me. We have to wait for a while. <laughs> okay, technology problem, you know. For, okay, for the first. Uh, <laughs> okay. 
is uh, Miss Claudia Kamar. January. She is head of public governance on Basel Institute on Governance, Basel, Switzerland. And she is responsible for development, oversight, and management of the institute research and technical assistance activities in the areas of public and global governance. As a researcher, she has been principal investigator for numerous multidisciplinary research projects. And recent project performing principal investigator functions include project addressing bribery and favoritism in the Tanzanian health sector, a behavioral approach funded by the GIA's program from January 2018 to December 2021, and also project harnessing informality, designing anti-corruption network intervention funded by the GIA's program from January 2018 to November 2021. And she is also responsible for acquiring and managing technical assistance project on public governance and corruption prevention for leading multilateral and bilateral development agencies. And she is also the implementer for the prevention pillar activities, FCDO funded intervention, tackling serious and organized corruption in Malawi from 2018 through 2024. And uh, about the uh, educational background, from 1996 and 2023, she received PhD in political science uh, in the fields of comparative politics, international relations, Latin American studies from the University of Notre Dame in USA and her graduate diploma in economics in fields micro and macroeconomics econometrics from University of Cambridge, England. And she also uh, received her BA in international relations in the field of international relations, political science, development studies, international law from the El Colegio de Mexico, Mexico City. And about skill and com competencies, her areas of expertise in, is in corruption, risk assessment, and law as corruption prevention intervention design, particular expertise in assessing informal and behavioral drivers and developing social norms and approaches. Besides, uh, uh, this main activities, she also has been uh, active in organizational activities and she, her uh, skills, managerial skills is in leadership, managing interdisciplinary teams of up to 12% and oversight of research activities concurrently conducted in up to seven countries. And she has also have selected publications comprising um, informal networks and what they mean for anti-corruption practice policy brief. And uh, that, that's all yeah, the uh, curriculum vitae of Ms. Camargo. Uh, and uh, we go on to the next um, panelist today. We have a doctor, it is, it is not doctor, uh, Ms. Mudiati Rahmatun Nisa. PhD. Yeah. She is uh, chair of program uh, of UNPAD, and uh, uh, she received her PhD in Asian Studies from the University of Western Australia in 2010, and she received a Master of Arts in Public Policy from Murdoch University, Australia, and her bachelor in Governance Science from FISIP Universitas Pajajaran in 1993. Her work experience is the uh, lecture from uh, pol political science in, uh, in uh, uh, FISIP and also in political science in UPN Veteran Jakarta since uh, 2020 until present. She is also the Lecturer at the um, study of government science of FISIP UNPAD and FISIP uh, Universitas Computer Indonesia from 2002 through 2004. And her expertise is public policy, local politics, gender, and also on the uh, general elections. And her research activities in the last five years comprising decentralizations of education in Indonesia, post-reforms, and so on. And uh, that's all the curriculum vitae of our... 
panelists will have 30 minutes to deliver the presentation and panels will reserve 20 minutes for questions and answers after the last panelist has concluded the presentation. And for the first opportunity, please welcome uh, Dr. Camargo. Thank you. Thank you so much. I hope that you have my presentation uploaded. Yes, there it is. Okay, so uh, l l let's move to the first slide. Um, I want to tell you a little bit beforehand about my institute uh, so that you learn a little bit where we're coming from. So we're an independent nonprofit Swiss. Now it's back. Let's, let's have a backup. Yeah. yeah that's okay, thank you. So we're an independent nonprofit, um, a Swiss foundation. Um, our core mandate is to fight corruption and strengthen governance uh, around the world. Uh, we are a staff of over 100 people with more than 25 nationalities represented. Um, we have HQ, our headquarters in Basel, Switzerland, where when I live, um, but we have field teams in seven countries, including in Indonesia, where Ray here is one of our esteemed colleagues uh, working with us. Um, we are an institute of the... Um, Can we go to the next slide, please? Okay, this is just to give you an idea of where we work. So, so we really work globally. Um, some countries, we have a um, permanent presence, and those would be the countries in red in the map. And I know that Indonesia, for the moment, is only um, green, but uh, we have a, now a presence here as well. Can we go to the next slide? How we work? Well, we deploy a variety of different methodologies. Um, so some of our teams work from the law enforcement side of things. Other colleagues like us in our, in our team, we work on corruption prevention. We engage with public and private actors. And we base our work on research to understand thoroughly the context where we work and then develop technical assistance programs to help fight corruption. Can we go to the next one, please? So we have five different divisions. The biggest one is the International Center for Asset Recovery. So these colleagues are law enforcement specialists. They work shoulder to shoulder with the law enforcement agencies in our partner countries to help identify, freeze, and ultimately bring back assets and, and uh, resources that have been stolen uh, through corruption. The collective action team works mostly with the private sector, uh, engaging in multi-stakeholder initiatives to fight corruption. Um, public governance, that's, that's the division that I uh, had, and I will speak in detail about our work in a little bit, so I won't say anything more right now. Compliance and corporate governance are colleagues that are working with um, concrete uh, private sector actors, uh, helping them build up their compliance uh, mechanisms. And our youngest member in the institute is the Green Corruption Team, that specializes on crimes of the environmental crimes and how corruption enables environmental crimes. Let's go to the next slide, please. Okay, so now I'm going to tell you, uh, I want to give you like a bird's eye view of the kind of work that we do in our division, the public governance division. And basically our work philosophy is that there is no one-size-fits-all approach to fight corruption, which means that we need to really do a lot of thorough research to understand the countries where we work, um, to then develop technical assistance programs 
to prevent corruption that will be effective. Next slide, please. Okay, so our starting point, what are the main or the conventional anti-corruption approaches? So basically, let me tell you a little bit anecdotically um, how I started my career in this field. So I joined the institute in 2009, and my first project was to look at corruption in the health systems of low-income countries. So I was coming from a different field. I was dealing more with democratization and economic reform. So I thought, okay, I, I need to start understanding what, how are people um, measuring and understanding corruption um, in this frame, in this kind of frameworks, especially not so much from the academic side, but what are practitioners doing? So what are organizations like the UN or the World Bank or the bilateral donors, how do they treat corruption? How do they conceptualize corruption? And to my big surprise, what I found out was that uh, back then, uh, what we had as tools to measure corruption and anti-corruption were really just checklists of whether there were laws or uh, rules and regulations in place um, criminalizing corruption, sanctioning corruption, forbidding corruption, but it stopped at this level. And the reason why it surprised me, and I don't know if this is something that is going to resonate with you, but I'm Mexican, okay? So I was born in Mexico, I grew up in Mexico, and in my country we have a lot of corruption. So growing up, I always, you know, we always had our civic lessons at school, and uh, we knew about the constitution and all of this. We learned at the school how things should work, but then in practice we know as soon as we step out of the classroom, things were completely different, right? So I was very puzzled. Why are people trying to understand corruption by looking at the laws? I know in my country nobody's following the laws. So, 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 so we're wasting our time here pretty much. So most of the mainstream anti-corruption approaches had focused with this legal perspective. You know, criminalizing, um, um, uh, introducing monitoring mechanisms, uh, social accountability mechanisms, uh, formal incentives. And I just knew, and then the research confirmed, that most of the countries with the biggest corruption problems, it's not that they have bad laws. Some of them actually have excellent laws. Uh, Uganda is one country where we have worked a lot, and it has the biggest body of anti-corruption legislation in the world, and it has one of the worst rankings in the Transparency International Corruption Perception Index. Next slide, please. Okay, so, so this really marked the trajectory of the research that then I decided that I wanted to take on. So I wanted to understand, I know that the laws and the formal prescriptions are not um, shaping the observed outcomes, at least when it comes to corruption and anti-corruption. I want to understand what is. Because in spite of Mexico being a country where laws are, are not followed, and in, in fact, the popular culture is pretty much the opposite. In the popular culture, the one who follows the law is the stupid one, right? And the one that breaks the law and gets away with it, that's... You probably have heard about our drug uh, lords and chapo and these kind of people who are famous criminals, and popularly they are heroes. So, there you go, big problem. So, so I wanted to understand if the laws are not working, what is? What are the informal rules of the game, the unwritten understandings, uh, informal accountability lines that are actually shaping how people make their decisions? So. When I say what explains the implementation gap, the implementation gap means you have the law that is supposed to be implemented, but it's not. So the distance between the law and reality, this is the implementation gap. 
So I want to understand why, why this happens. I want to explore the systems of informality that are responsible for the outcomes that we see. And this has taken us in many different directions. We are doing a lot of work on how social norms and, and behavioral drivers are incentivizing and fueling corruption. Uh, we're looking at corruption as a networked phenomenon. So in the conventional anti-corruption uh, approach, um, corruption is treated as an individual crime. Yeah? And it's targeting the individual and individual incentives. However, from our research, we very well know that this is not true. I mean, corruption is not a problem of a few bad apples. Let's just agree on that. Corruption is a very much networked problem. And this is, you, you know, this explains why it's so difficult to get rid of it. Because you can take the leader out of the equation, but the network is going to live on. So, so we're doing a lot of work on conceptualizing um, corruption as a networked phenomenon. Um, we are also very interested in designing and piloting inter anti corruption interventions through innovative uh, adopting um, new uh, ideas and, and seeing in practice what works and what doesn't. Because we, I also find that uh, a lot of the anti-corruption prax praxis, if you want, is not based on evidence. It's just based on what people think should be working, but there's no evidence. So, so in, in our team, we're very, very keen to produce evidence. This kind of approach works, works in this kind of context for X, Y, Z reasons. And we're also uh, working quite a bit in uh, understanding transnational criminal networks because, of course, corruption is not just, you know, neatly packed in, in, in national, you know, in, uh, uh, units, but it's uh, very much a transnational. So we've done a bit of work in analyzing criminal networks uh, of illegal wildlife trafficking. Um, you, some of you might be f um, familiar with the Odebrecht scandal in, in Brazil, and my colleague Jacopo, who is, who, who is here today, he's a social network analysis expert, and he has mapped these uh, transnational criminal networks to a great degree of detail. Um, I mean, he can even speak about it if there are questions uh, on that. Uh, next slide, please. Next slide. Okay, here we go. So, so let, let me tell you a little bit about the findings of our research, which I think you might find interesting and maybe you can also then uh, reflect to what extent you see uh, some of these things reflected in Indonesia, uh, in the case of Ind Indonesia or not. So, so we've done a lot of research on informal networks and social norms. So what we find uh, essentially, in a nutshell, is that informal social networks are a very powerful resource that are, is utilized by 
you name it, political elites, bureaucrats, citizens, private, uh, actor, private sector actors to achieve something they want. Okay, so to give a concrete example, so in our daily lives, we of course all of us have social networks, we all have families, friends, and so on, and this can be very useful resources. So when you need a favor, you look in your network. Who can give me this favor? Who can help me with this problem I have? Do you, do you have a good doctor for this kind of specialty? Uh, do you have, you know, I'm, I'm in trouble with the police. Do you have somebody who can help? Um, and so on and so forth. So, so what this means is that the social networks are very important, they are valued, and they are also instrumental to, um, to, to achieve collective goals. We find that these social networks um, across different regional settings normally are brought together and they stay very cohesive and effective because they are bound together by social norms of solidarity, of reciprocity, of a sense of moral obli obligation towards the group, for example. So, in most countries, if you are, say, somebody who is not willing to make a favor to, some, to, 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 to somebody in your family or in your group friends, or you are seen as somebody who's ungrateful, this is not going to send you to jail, of course, but there's going to be a social... So these social pressures and these social costs are incredibly powerful. So this means that the, the social networks are very, um, very important, very prescriptive even uh, social con constructions that very strongly model the way we behave and we make, uh, how we make decisions. So, let, I will elaborate a little bit more and you will understand better what I'm saying. But so, so, so also, why, what does all of this that I'm talking about has to do with corruption? So let me tell you about that and we can go to the next slide. Here we go. Okay, so for example, the social network is about getting things done. And on the left you see, I think, a very typical scenario. This, this, was, this one happens across the world. You incur a traffic violation, you're stopped by a traffic officer, you're in trouble. And I think that bribery of traffic police is one of the most common sources of bribery around the world. However, in many countries where we work, what we're told is, when you give a bribe, it's not just a one-off transaction. Of course, it's a transaction that is going to get you off the hook. It's going to solve your problem that you have right now. But what we're also told is, well, it is also going to make a social connection with this traffic officer. I don't know how it's here in Indonesia. But in many countries in where we work, um, what research participants have told us is after the bribe has been exchanged, you probably also exchange phone numbers so that I know that the next time that I'm stopped, I can call my policeman friend and say, hey, please help me out. He will, of course, he will get some additional amount of money. And so this, this builds an ongoing and mutually beneficial relation. So this is, in a way, opting the, this police officer into your network. So now you have this useful resource. And now if my colleague is also stopped, she can call me and I say, ah, I have a great policeman friend that can help you. Let me call him, right? So you're building these social networks that are durable because they are useful they on these expectations of reciprocity and they become very very durable because they are mutually beneficial okay and they are incentivizing and perpetuating this bribery so this is starting at the small level 
However, what I want to tell you is that this a very similar pattern we see also with the big things. So the way electoral coalitions are formed in many countries is a very similar one. You know, who you bring on board are useful people. So, so maybe I need to bring on board uh, a member of a certain uh, profession or of a, I need representation from a certain region. You know, politicians know what they need to get a winning position, to win an election. So they know they need to recruit, they co-opt and build this network. And then, of course, the expectation is if you join me, so I'm Claudia, I'm going to run for president, I'm going to invite my colleagues to be part of my, you know, electoral team because they bring specific assets. We will win the election, and then, of course, they will be expected to get an appointment as minister or as director of and also because we are friends, they are expecting they'll be allowed to fill their pockets without, with impunity. So this is about so building social networks to get things done as small as, you know, getting out of a traffic violation and as big as winning elections. Can we go to the next slide? Now, what's the really interesting other side of the story is that building these networks, it also creates ambivalence and tensions. So these networks are useful, they are beneficial, but they also lock you in. So let me give you two examples, again, small and, and, and large. Um, from some of my research in Tanzania, I remember speaking to a young doctor, and he was telling me, well, you know, going through medical school here in Tanzania is very, very expensive. So normally, the entire family has to pitch in. And they pitch in, of course, because they are my family, they care about me, but also because they see it as an investment. So once the, this person graduated from medical school, the entire family was expecting, now we have a doctor in the family, now he's going to look after us. So whenever there are school fees that need to be paid, funerals, weddings, you name it, everybody looks to the doctor to pay. Because, of course, this put medical school. Um, so the harsh reality, of course, is that being a doctor in the public sector in Tanzania pays a tiny salary. So this is just a generic example that we see replicated in other countries where public officials have very low salaries, but the families have huge expectations. So then the pressures to abuse the public office, to extract resources, be it by bribing, be it by embezzling, by stealing um, uh, medicines from the facility, whatever, uh, becomes very, very strong. And of course, if, if uh, a finding that we also see over and over is that if you are see, if you're acting honestly, so you're not stealing money, you are following the rules, then you are considered to be useless, you are considered to be ungrateful, and not willing to make an effort for your family. So the social costs, like I was telling you before, are, can be really dramatic just by being honest and act, adhering to the law and not being corrupt. So people in these kind of situations are locked in you know, in a situation that is very difficult to escape. And a, a lot of them are really under a lot of stress because they have also this role as a public official to play, but at the same time, this pr social pressure to constantly incentivize them to break the law and to um, acquire resources illicitly. And actually, it's, it's my uh, belief that the same thing happens with political elites. So, if I run for president with my colleagues supporting me, now they are ministers, they have been filling up their pockets. If I want to say I have a moment of revelation and I decide 
clean up my government, I don't want corruption anymore. It's not that easy, because now I have all these people around me that have been supporting me, that are very corrupt, but without whose support I cannot survive. So I'm locked in as well. So this is the reason why when people say, oh, there's, there's so much corruption, it's because there's no political I, I think it's more complicated. Um, can we go to the next slide, please? Okay, so this is, I, I don't expect you to understand the whole thing. It's, it's just a poster that we did showing the work um, of, um, where we designed and piloted an intervention to target social norms of corruption. So what I'm trying to tell you here is that, that for us, the next this research is to understand how can we put this knowledge that we have acquired into practice to actually try to change something. So this was an intervention that we um, did in the Tanzanian health sector, in a Tanzanian hospital, targeting the social norm of reciprocity that was encouraging bribery health facility. So maybe basically what we did, we had a two-pronged approach. So on the one hand, we, knowing that social networks are so important, like I've been telling you they are very powerful mechanisms, we thought, well, we need networks to defeat networks. So what we did is that we recruited, I believe, 25 health workers from the hospitals, and we trained them to be our champions. We trained them, we gave them a lot of resources, materials, and a lot of encouragement to go out and disseminate th this message that bribery is wrong amongst their peers. The idea being that if you receive a message from somebody who you trust, it's likely to have greater impact than if it's some impersonal government campaign or public education pain or something like that. So that's the first thing we do. We did. The second thing we did, we intervened directly in the hospital with posters and desk signs. And you can see those, the, the, well, a little bit you can see, probably not much. Uh, but uh, but we, we put posters in very visible places where people would be waiting to receive treatment and, uh, and desk signs on each and every desk. In the, in, the, in the hospital. Long story short, it was a very successful uh, intervention. We notably had a um, gift giving score, gift giving being, of course, the euphemism for a bribe. Um, and it, we found that it went down from 23 to 13%, which is, um, I, I think, it's, it's quite a nice uh, result. Anyway, uh, next slide, please. Um, then, like I was saying, we are also analyzing and studying social networks from a more rigorous perspective. Um, so, my colleague Jacopo, he is an expert in social network analysis, like proper social network analysis. Um, he has mapped and studied and analyzed the network of a very famous, well, famous, infamous um, trafficker of uh, illegal wildlife based in Uganda, who was recently um, convicted in the US, uh, showing how this industry uh, spans really not just, it's not just wildlife from Africa coming to Asia, but it really has tentacles spreading pretty much across all. Um, all continents. Um, yeah. Ne next slide, please. Okay, and maybe just the last word uh, to, 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 to uh, explain a little bit why we're here um, in Indonesia. Our institute is part of a project called the Integritas Project. It's, it is funded by USAID. Uh, it's a consortium of four um, non-for-profits. Uh, Basel is the international partner, and we work with Ichewe, 
we work with TII and we work with Chemitran. Um, we specific, so, so the consortium is looking at the uh, di different uh, themes, but mostly uh, preoccupied with corruption in the natural resource sector. Um, and looking at conflict of interest as a problem that underpins uh, corruption issues. So we ourselves, we work with, uh, with CSOs and government partners. Uh, we are working with Transparency International Indonesia to do an impact assessment of the Stranas PK uh, prevention uh, strategy. Uh, we're working on capacity building with a delivered uh, uh, training on research methods to each away. Um, we support more effective anti-corruption messaging and public education campaigns based on the, what we know the evidence tells us about what works and what doesn't in, in, in anti-corruption messaging. And our colleagues from the private sector team are working with SOEs and the private sector and many of their activities are focused on natural resources. So I think this is the last of my slides and I'll stop here, thank you so much. Okay, thank you so much, Dr. Camargo, for the uh, interesting presentations and I believe that uh, the audience here is becoming uh, more curious about how to tackle down the problems of uh, anti-corruption, uh, I'm sorry, about corruption and also how to implement good and corporate governance. And uh, thank you very much. And we go on to uh, Dr. Mudiati Rahmatunisa to uh, present. Yeah. The time and place is yours. Thank you very much, uh, moderator, my colleague. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Good afternoon, everyone. The Honorable Miss Camargo, uh, Mr. Jacob, uh, Dean, and Vice Dean, and also our managers. And of course, uh, my student, our student here, mostly an undergraduate, actually. So um, perhaps uh, I will touch more generic um, uh, issue here, but later on I will touch uh, the issue about corruption as well. So um, based on the uh, direction from the committee, so I will uh, discuss about the same theme actually challenge and opportunities in adopting uh, good and clean governance, but uh, related to Indonesian case. Um, yeah, hopefully um, I will add uh, more uh, insightful information, especially for our students, because just a few days ago, we discussed about uh, good governance as a concept, and uh, uh, the critiques, and the effectiveness of the implementations of the good governance. So um, I will start uh, with the first. So this, this is the outline of my presentation. will be divided into four uh, main theme. First, of course, because I consider about my student, I'm so sorry if I will touch about the, uh, uh, the concept, uh, the meaning and the relations uh, with the concept. Because sometimes, uh, empirically, we know the, the term like clean and good governance. But what exactly is that? Um, sometimes we have a, a heated debate in class as well uh, regarding this kind of um, concept. Then I will continue my presentations about the good and clean governance practices in Indonesia. Uh, I don't think it's a very long experience because uh, it will start when the authoritarian regime um, uh, collapsed in uh, mid 1998. And then I will discuss about the challenges and opportunities that we face as a country. So 
corruption is not only the problem, actually. We also have other challenges. But at the same time, we still have uh, the bright side. Uh, we still have the opportunity to continue uh, the uh, uh, positive or potential benefits that we can get from uh, uh, implementing a good governance. And then I will end my presentation with a brief closing remarks. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, the overview of the concept, uh, especially um, I will explain about the concept about the uh, good governance since uh, that term actually uh, relatively new in Indonesia. But uh, conceptually or theoretically, the governance itself is already, it's, uh, quite an um, old concept. But when we talk about good government or good governance, it's quite new actually. So next. So here, uh, I would like to um, inform the student especially that uh, the concept of good governance today has uh, its uh, specific, uh, what you call it, history. Yeah? Uh, originally, it's not uh, known as uh, the term uh, good governance, but actually it starts with different uh, concepts. Yeah, and uh, the good governance uh, practices actually originated uh, or trended since 1980s. So it's not uh, quite long, right? And as part of political conditionality under the Washington Consensus. So it's originally from this kind of consensus. It's not originally from us from Indonesia. I think we have to underline that because uh, today there are many critics about the implementations, about the compatibility of the concept of the program uh, due to um, significant gap between conceptual calculation or theoretical calculation and the empirical evidence. Um, so. I think bear in mind that uh, this is the original um, history of good governance. So, um, in this case, um, aid receiving countries uh, is asked to uh, undertake governance as part of uh, continuing uh, donor lending. Yeah, not just policy reforms, yeah? For what? To ensure that the development assistance is used effectively. So if it's kind of prerequisite, yeah? If you want more loan, then you have to adjust. Any kind of adjustment, they ask, yeah? Uh, and behind this Washington consensus, there are the IMF, of course, World Bank, and also the United States uh, Treasury Department, Treasury Department, uh, which uh, insists on good governance as prerequisite for the aid back then. Yeah, and the practice itself called selectivity. And apart from that, yeah, why they insist to uh, to uh, make a prerequisite for continuing the, uh, the aid because of the growing satisfactions with state failure and corruption. So they want to make secure their money. Yeah, they want to make sure that their money, their, their money will come back. So, so if they want to get their money back, they have to make sure, yeah, that the, the country's recipient uh, have a, a need and yeah, effective, effective government. Next slide. So this one is, yeah, bear in mind, structural adjustment programs, yeah, uh, uh, applied by international financial institution, 
Yeah. So the the proponents of this are up until now is the World Bank and IMF. So when receiving countries get the loan and have to uh, do some uh, social adjustment programs, there are two type of uh, activities immediately they have to do. First one is stabilization. That is immediate devaluation and often drastic public expenditure cuts. And then the other one is adjustment. What's that? Transform economic structures and institutions through varying doses of deregulations. It happened in Indonesia. Deregulation, privatization, slimming down allegedly oversized public bureaucracies, reducing subsidies like happened today, <laughs> and encouraging realistic prices to emerge as stimulus to greater efficient efficiency and productivity, especially for export. They are the agenda. Yeah. So this is two type of activity as part of structural adjustment program. Next. Considering that kind of program, structural adjustment, uh, uh, adjustment it is um, as a condition for lending development assistance, the World Bank actually requires the recipient government show effective performance. They want to make sure they run back. Effective performance and to promote further reforms based on their uh, design. Yeah, reform. And then the World Bank, at the same time, can promote legal and civil service reform based on their design. It's kind of blueprint. Yeah. And transparency and accountability, budgetary discipline, and also fiscal management in pursuance of the agenda. So why they do that? Yeah, because it is believed that with good governance, that is combating corruption, nepotism, um, bureaucracy mismanagement, um, and transparency and accountability, and also proper procedures, aid would be effectively used to achieve the objective of reducing poverty. See, that's the rationale why uh, I mean, it's a bit altruist, yeah? but because we are political scientists, sometimes we have to see beyond that. <laughs> Sorry to say that. <laughs> but this is the formal, formal claim. <laughs> see, very ideal. Very, uh, it's uh, uh, hard to deny that this is not good, right? That's, that's why it's good. Okay, next. Okay. And then. There is a shift in 1990s in which the term good governance for the first time launched. Yeah. Why? Based on the World Bank report in 1989, they found that there was some kind of crisis of governance as the cause of uh, the ineffective use of development aid in the region. They blame the, the government, the government process. Yeah, the crisis of governance is the one to be blamed uh, of the case of ineffective use of uh, development aid in the region. And then the paper, a World Bank staff paper in 1991, then identify external agencies as potentially key players capable of exerting considerable influence in promoting good and bad governance. So it's not automatically like facilitating the good governance. So why? Because of that, in 1992, the World Bank introduced the term, the concept, 
good governance as part of its criteria for lending to developing countries. That's the first time the term good governance launch introduced by the World Bank. So now, as you know, it's a buzzword for many government departments, for donor agency, including the academics, yeah, good governance, including our countries. Yeah. That's why Nanda here says that good governance has assumed the status of mantra yeah, for donor agencies as well as donor countries. Yeah. Seems no critiques, no flaws, something like that. <laughs> Next, so this is the scene. So after that, since 1992, we are witnessing uh, many studies on the effectiveness of the uh, good governance uh, practices in many countries. It leads to different meaning of the concept as the consequences of many studies conducting uh, uh, studies on the practices of uh, good governance. So here, for example, I quote uh, the meaning from United Nations. In the community of nations, governance is considered good and democratic to the degree in which a country's institutions and processes are transparent. That's one principle. Its institution refer to such bodies as, I mean, parliament exists, yeah, beside that, parliament and its various ministries. And its process includes such as key activities as election and legal procedures, which must be seen to be free of corruption and accountable to the people. See, this is the empirical practices of good governance. Yeah, there is a functional parliament, yeah, a process, transparent accountability, uh, free and fair elections, free from corruption. That's the empirical activities of the concept of good governance. So good governance promotes equity. But I will treat this as a potential, yeah, potential benefit. Because it not, does not necessarily promote equity. It needs many other preconditions to materialize this kind of potential benefits. But here, yeah, according to the United Nations, good governance promotes equity, participation. This is the, this is the principle that you need to just bear in mind. Yeah? Uh, and then pluralism, transparency, accountability, and the rule of law in the manner that is effective, efficient, and enduring. Who can resist this? Who can't resist this? This is very good value, right? <laughs> See? <laughs> it's too good to, uh, too good to, you know, to reject, to be rejected. It's very good value. Um, in getting these principles into practice, we see the holding of free elections. That's the manifestations of the value. Equity, participation, manifest in what? in free and fair election, yeah, frequent election, and then representative, representative legislators that make laws, so functional representatives, provide oversight to the works of the executive and independent judiciary to interpret those laws. Yeah? See, this is one example of the meaning of good governance from United Nations. Next. This one from UNDP, yeah, uh, this is the one that uh, often I find in uh, the uh, student dissertation when they uh, write about good governance. The UNDP meaning always uh, uh, mentioned, yeah. Good governance refers to governing system which are capable, responsive, inclusive, and transparent. All countries developed and developing 
countries need to work continuously towards better governance. All good. <laughs> good or democratic governance entails meaningful. Yeah. This is this is very important. Meaningful and inclusive political participation. Yeah. And then improving governance should include more people having more of a say in decisions which shape their lives. So this is what participation, inclusive process of governance. That's from UNDP. Next one. Of course, from the World Bank. Here I quote the statement of Paul Wawrich. Yeah, World Bank uh, president in uh, Good governance is essentially the combinations of transparent, accountable institution, strong skills and competence, and a fundamental willingness to do the right thing. Yeah, those are the things that enable a government to deliver services to its people efficiently. See, this uh, another uh, definition of good governance. Next. IMF, of course, right? One of the strong proponents of good governance. Good governance is important for the countries at all stages of development. Our approach is to concentrate on those aspects of good governance that are most closely related to our surveillance of our macroeconomic policies. That's why the structural programs touch this area. Namely, the transparency of government accounts, the effectiveness of public resource management, and the stability and transparency of economic and regulatory environment or private sector activity. This is um, another one from the IMF. The next one. Next, uh, so basically there are plenty of uh, definition of good governance, but if you try to synthesize all the value of those definitions, yeah, according to the World Bank Institute, there are at least five aspects, yeah, five main aspects of good governance. First one, voice and accountability, which includes civil liberties and political stability. Bear in mind, this is the concept, right? Because the empirical activities, uh, yeah, we can see uh, empirically, like free and fair election. The second one, government effectiveness, which includes the quality of policy making and public service delivery. Government effectiveness. The next one, lack of regulatory burden. Yeah, and then the rule of law, which includes the protections of property rights. The last one, independence of judiciary and control of corruption. That's the main aspect of good governance. Yeah, we consider that there are many, uh, many definitions. But if we synthesize, at least according to the World Bank Institute, there are five main aspects. Next. Okay, now after we talk about the concept, then we talk about the empirical activities. Yeah, manifest in what kind of activities? Yeah, the practices of good governance empirically. We can see, first one, in free, fair, and regular election. So why now we have regular, free, and fair election? It's part of... Yeah, quote unquote, structural adjustment programs from the world, I should say. I'm, I'm just. Next one. A representative parliament, yeah, functional uh, parliament that makes regulation and provides supervision, oversight, yeah, parliamentary oversight, and independent and accountable judiciary that interprets laws. That's the another uh, empirical activities of good governance as a concept. And it promotes human, uh, human rights and rule of law. Okay? And then good governance also emphasizes the importance of devolving power. 
happen in Indonesia. Decentralized station policy, right? That's part of the concept of good governance. Yeah, devolving powers and resources to local governments. Decentralization with citizens and civil society organizations and greater opportunity to play an active role. Yeah, bring government closer to the to the people. That's decentralization is all about. Yeah, and to set priorities for the most vulnerable people in the society. So that's that's the empirical activities that we can we can see uh, in empirical life. Next one. Okay. Now we are familiarized with in Indonesia. I know. Uh, sorry if I uh, mention in Bahasa, right? Yeah. Uh, pemerintahan yang bersih. Yeah. Yeah, good and clean. Itu menjadi frasa ya. It becomes a famous phrase in our country. Yeah. And what exactly the relationship between clean government, clean governance, good governance, yeah, and then the output. So basically, clean governance promote good governance. But to be able to facilitate those potential benefits, this relationship needs effective public financial accountability. Relationship between the country's governing bodies and its executive management. Yeah, harmonious relationship. And then transparent decision making. And then stakeholders' participations and of course ethical practices. That's when good governance able to minimize systematic corruption. I oh, know it's not as you said. It's not as simple as that. It's it's actually uh, more complex. But this is statement that I can get from the literature. I mean, this is interesting to discuss and uh, to what's that? Uh, to check empirically whether it's uh, confirmed or not. So, but I will read it. So, uh, it can minimize uh, systemic corruption, yeah, mitigate fraud, waste and abuse in the use of public funds, and highlights breakdowns in the rule of law so they can be dealt with appropriate and in timely way. Yeah, but they need, yeah, the relationship could facilitate this kind of uh, output or, or outcomes if these four um, aspect uh, also involved. Okay, that's the relationship of the uh, concept. Next. Okay, now we will move on to the practice of a clean and a good and clean governance in Indonesia. Okay, next slide. Okay, so it happens post. Suharto's regime collapse. Yeah, Indonesia has embarked on a commitment for democracy and less centralized government. Yeah, democratization and decentralization. The introductions of good governance has been accommodated through numerous innovative policies. So if we want to see where is the practice of good governance in Indonesia, we can see from many innovative policies in both the private and public sector. Yeah, because of that, uh, USA uh, report that the institutional structure of democracy is now in place. But functional or not, that's empirical question. Yeah, according to the USA report, and then uh, we also witnessing that the media and civil society are free and play a significant role in promoting transparency. And also, we have a parliament that now has power to scrutinize the executive branch. Yeah, which didn't happen before, during the authoritarian uh, era. And then government has been decentralized because uh, at that time, we we had a very advanced 
uh, decentralization policy because almost all uh, jurisdiction dispersed to local government. So that's why some said that substantively uh, Indonesia is kind of federalist because of that, because of the character of the uh, law uh, of um, local government at the time. But then it revised because many disagree with that. Because many of, uh, for example, uh, uh, department in uh, central government as well as uh, governors who lost many jurisdictions because uh, they have to disperse the power to the second level of local government. They protested and then the law revised after the law is uh, only uh, have one year uh, implementation and then it revised and then replaced by a new one. Okay? Uh, that's the, the beginning of uh, our good governance practices. Next. Okay. Now, how can we measure? How can we measure the practice of good governance? There are many index actually that we can use. Here, uh, I use the Worldwide Governance Indicator, WGI, which assesses and monitors governance performance based on six dimensions of governance. The first one is voice and accountability. As we can see here, the trend is uh, pretty good, uh, uh, not uh, going down, the trend. And then also political stability and absence of violence or terrorism. Which one? Which one? I don't, can't see. The second one. Okay. okay. The second right, yeah. Uh, pretty good as well. And then uh, this, the, 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 next, the next one is government effectiveness. The trend is okay. And then also regulatory quality. Appreciate it. And then also regu uh, rule of law. Nah. Except for, I think it's related to you, we need to have a different strategy. <laughs> because we all, always mention that if we talk about corruption, then tougher the law, right? Or death penalty. Yeah? And you, you said that this is a formal, you know, like ordinary strategy that we know it's not. Uh, in, ineffective in combating corruption. That's why you propose, like, uh, I think this is alternative strategy in combating uh, corruption. And I'm, I'm really um, excited to know the result, whether it's effective or not, you know, if we implement it in Indonesia. Yeah? Okay, based on these six um, uh, dimensions, uh, in its report, the World Bank notes that Indonesia actually, we have to admit it, has made a substantial improvement following the end of the New Order era in 1998. That's based on a uh, World Bank report. Okay? See, this is one, one way of uh, assessing uh, the practice of uh, good governance in Indonesia. There are other uh, index actually. You can uh, try to find it. Next one. Okay, now we are talking about the talents and the opportunities. Okay, uh, I will touch about your topic actually. <laughs> yeah, the first and foremost challenge is rampant corruption at all levels. Yeah, most experts believe that the corruption is getting worse. With decentralization, it's gone. Okay. And bureaucratic inefficiency remains problematic. Corruption, in turn, can prevent good governance principles and structures from being put in place yeah, or enforce violations of the principle of transparency, yeah, accountability, um, and rule of law appear to be the most closely associated with corruption, okay? This is the first challenge. Next one, first and foremost, I would say. And the next one, from my perspective, is about poverty. Why? Poverty creates distrust 
among people. Huh? In the governance mechanism, and the poor, yeah, and the poor exclude themselves from the political and social uh, processes, which further restrict their participation and representations in governance. And I have to inform you that the latest data, Indonesian poverty rate 2021 is still 50.20 percent. Yeah, more than half. And then the next challenge is we still have weak capacity of state and non-state institution. Yeah, as uh, Dr. Uh, Claudia said, yeah, like lower salary of civil service. Civil servants, yeah, diminish the motivation, inhibited efficiency, decline effectiveness, encourage corruption. Yeah, but I think we have to test this. If we give them like higher salary, then whether corruption, yeah, will be tackled or not. And then good governance demands new managerial skills from both state and non-state actors to perform effectively as partners yeah as partners of in governance the next one the challenge is lack of I think this is the most important thing yeah because now many parties are questioning the effectiveness of somewhat like blueprints made by other institution yeah from foreign country and then try to implement to Indonesia I think lack of good local gov uh, 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 sorry lack of good local knowledge and too much reliance on international agencies and international precepts in policy making leading to the wide concept reality gap yeah and the implementation deficit of good governance policy yeah we still have to admit that sad story is still dominant than happy story. And then the last one, this is uh, from my perspective as well, half-hearted gender empowerment, yeah, which then hinders the inclusive governance. That's five main challenges yeah, in Indonesia's practices uh, of uh, good governance. Next one. But don't worry, yeah, we still have the bright sides. Yeah. Um, we just need to, uh, what's that, uh, consistent. Yeah. The first one, normatively Indonesia has numerous innovative polic policies. We have to admit that. And uh, on good governance as the manifestations of state and society engagement. Yeah. Uh, sorry, agreement that good governance is vital for the country's prosperity and welfare. We do agree. Yeah. And then I think that's that's uh, the, the the strength that we we have. And then although corruption is still rampant, it has been on the top of the state reform agenda. And then the next one, reform agendas in other sectors like economy, political, and administrative have also been introduced. See, this is a, a good opportunity for us to consistently uh, implement uh, good governance. And then the emergence of media, NGOs, and pressures from international agencies have provided additional power to execute good governance policies. And then the last one, revolution in information and technology and globalization has considerably reduced the geographical boundaries and opened up ample opportunity of having public debate on policy issues and critically examine governmental policies and programs. Yeah, thanks to technology. If we use that in positive manner. Yeah. Next. Okay, this is the last slide of my presentation. So, if we consider the World Bank Government Index, it indicates that Indonesia has made a substantial improvement following the end of Suharto's authoritarian regime in 1998. However, we still have factors that could reduce or hinder optimal efforts to implement and realize the goals of good governance. In turn, it can be a source of 
dissatisfactions and democratic setback in the future. Hence, those factors need to be properly addressed in order to bo uh, bolster and further increase the achieved performance of good governance practices. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Mudiati Rahmatunisa. Okay, dear students, participants, ladies and gentlemen, we just have already had uh, the interesting presentations delivered from both distinguished speakers today. Now let's move to the next sessions, questions and answers. And uh, we have approximately uh, 20 minutes to discuss further and thoroughly uh, about uh, exploring the matters that, we ha that have been presented. And for this, we have uh, two kinds of uh, questions and answers for uh, the audience that uh, presenting here in, in this room and for those who are in the uh, Zoom meeting room. And uh, for uh, those in Zoom meeting room, you can either uh, type your questions on your chat box and, or post the questions uh, live to the speaker by uh, clicking the raise hand icon. And I will choose for... Uh, the very first attendee uh, to this type of questions. And yes, please, is, if there are any questions uh, that you would like to uh, give to the, the two, uh, two panelists today. OK. Uh, please, uh, you can, uh, someone, please someone help the, uh, yeah, to give this uh, microphone to, to the audience. Okay, thank you for the opportunity. Okay. Um, please introduce myself. Uh, um, I'm Putri Tambun from Government Science Major. And thank you for um, the matter that you guys delivered today. It's such an honor to um, follow the class. And my question is, speaking about corruption, it's true that it's complex. It's not individual things or individual decisions. Um, from what I have read from the slides, and as we know as well too, networks are effective for solving problems, but they also lock us in. Um, the question is how? How do we get out from the situation that forces us to do something that is wrong again or against our belief, but there is nothing we can do about it because we have no power, no, no authority to reject it. Is there something that we can do to change the game or then just walk away? Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for that question. Uh, so, in fact, okay, so, so there is corruption that we are forced or somehow pressured into engaging with, um, maybe because we feel we have no choice, or because it's just so much easier than the normal bureaucratic solution. So, so maybe getting a passport, like getting a passport in Mexico is likely going to take up to eight weeks if you're lucky, if your file doesn't get lost, um, you know, uh, if, if, if the stars align, I don't know. Um, if you pay a bribe, you have it in three days. Right? So uh, you, it, it's a way to make your life easier. Um, it can also be to solve a, a, a momentary emergency if I'm coming to the emergency room and there is a huge queue ahead of me, I'm just going to pay something to go to the front. So, so there, in, in this kind of situations, corruption is problem solving. And what we need to do for this kind, to address this kind of corruption is to look at the sources of the problem. So, you cannot get rid of bribery in the provision of public services if there's a huge asymmetry between the supply and the demand. Mm -hmm. So what we see in many developing countries is that we have very generous and ambitious laws uh, and the state is responsible for, for providing a, a lot of different benefits and services and so on and then the budgets are tiny. So that, that the supply, this means the effective supply of these public services is compromised because there are not enough resources behind it. And, as, and of course, the demand you have, like, like uh, Dr. Moody just told us, a 50% poverty rate in Indonesia, it's, it's mind-blowing. The need is huge, 
right? Yeah. So you have this huge demand and a co constrained supply. There's going to be corruption. You can tackle bribery, you know, by, by, by you know, some program here, some program there, but it's not going to go away. It's going to morph. It's going to, you know, maybe disappear here, but then reemerge here. It's not going to go away. We have some really nice examples, for example, in Georgia, for example, in Rwanda, um, those countries that have really implemented thorough reforms, that have invested serious amount of money in improving the quality and accessibility of public services, and petty corruption goes away because you don't need it anymore. If you don't need to pay a bribe anymore because the service is easy and quick for you to access, you know, you have no problem. And the same thing goes for, for instance, the issue of the salaries of public officials. So public officials need to be paid decently, you know, to be able to make a living on their salaries. But this one is a trickier one because there's this social norm aspect that I was talking about and the social expectation that if my uh, relative is a public official and God forbid if my relative is a high level politician, then I'm expecting that I'm going to be rich. <laughs> so the expectations of the families are important to also address somehow the social norm. There was a really interesting study in Ghana where they uh, wanted to tackle the corruption in the judiciary. So they gave the judges a massive salary increase. And guess what? The result was that there was even more corruption. You know what? Because the families thought, now we are super rich. Now we want a lot. <laughs> so the, <laughs> the salary increase was not enough to cover this demand. So you have to look at the root causes that might be systemic, like in the supply and the demand. But there's more often than not going to be some kind of social component. Yeah. Thank you, um, uh, Dr. Camargo. And is there any questions from the audience here? Okay. Yes, please. Uh, test. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Atur from Political Science. Uh, so, um, um, Dr. Moody said in class said that 50% of our public policy problem could be solved if we understand the root issues of uh, the causes of the problems that we face in our governance, in our national governance or in local governance. Uh, I want to ask uh, both of you questions in in your perspective and in your uh, expertise in research and education field. Uh, in developing countries, what are the biggest and most concerning root causes that happen mostly in developing countries? I think that's my question. Thank you. Well, uh, I think the if, if you force me, if I were forced to give my top one, it's um, electoral campaign financing. This is the root cause. And, 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 and I'm putting this in number one because it's really um, directly linked to grant corruption on the one hand, and I can explain why. But secondly, because this is a phenomenon that we really see worldwide. And this is equally in low income, middle income, high income countries this issue of private interest capturing elected officials through their campaign donations is, we just have it everywhere, and it's hugely, hugely problematic because we have our elected representatives who are not representing the, what's best for the, the poorest. They are representing what's best for the people who help them get into power. You know, and we see this. I mean, the United States <laughs> obviously has been a, a more blatant recent example of how this happens, even in so-called advanced consolidated democracies. But we see it all over the place. You no, know? where we see that after an election has been won, 
And then those businesses or those business interests that favored and that heavily financed the newly elected incumbent are getting the huge public works contracts, are getting huge advantage. They are even getting laws tailored, adopted, that favor their industry and their business, in a very, sometimes in a very shamelessly way, um, where laws are written pretty much to favor one single company, you know? So to me, this is probably the biggest problem that, um, ex that initiates and exacerbates and keeps us locked in these systems of corruption. Yeah. It's okay, Dr. Camargo. How about uh, Dr. Muriat? Is there any uh, answer for this, this kind of question? Just adding. I think um, what Dr. Claudia said already answer your questions, right? I always remind my students that if we really know the root of the problem or the core of the problem, then 50% problem solved. Because we know what remedy, what the, uh, the, the proper one, the proper strategy to overcome the problem. But the thing is that sometimes we only uh, capture, uh, you know, the surface of the problem and then directly we try to compose the, the strategy or uh, the um, uh, solution for that kind of problem without, you know, further... Um, examine uh, the root of the problem. So that's why in, uh, in, in my um, subject, uh, public policy, yeah, it's like doctor, right? If we diagnose, uh, diagnose the, uh, the disease, it's like, oh, it's only like fever. And then we just give them aspirin or something like that without checking what cause of the fever itself. Could infection or you know, growing meat for kids or any. But if we stop that, okay, we were just aspirin or something like that. We didn't finish the, or uh, um, didn't overcome the problem. So it will come, it, it can gain fever again. Because we did not solve the core or the root. It's like corruption. Sometimes it's difficult to, you know, to uncover uh, this kind of phenomena because it's very, you know, sometimes it's like beyond our, you know, uh, well, the observation, something like that. And behind that, we know there's so many intertwined factors, actors, interests, and something like that. Uh, that's why perhaps in Indonesia, it's the, the, the problem is so, so hard to tackle. That's why I'm interested in knowing you know, the result of your uh, research in using this kind of alternative strategy. Yeah? I think um, it will uh, give us um, yeah, alternatives uh, to overcome. Hopefully, that, uh, at least it will reduce the Pre uh, prevalent case of, of uh, corruption in our country, hopefully. So I'm looking forward to it. Okay, thank you, Dr. Mudiati Rahmatunisa. Okay, is there any questions? Okay. Well, we have two, uh, yeah, two questions here. Perhaps for the first, uh, we'll be given to, uh, yeah, what's your name, please? Good afternoon. Sorry, my English is not uh, clear. Uh, I want to know if uh, our letter I can speak French. Maybe she's from <laughs> Swiss. We speak Or maybe you, you can speak Portuguese also? <laughs> 
Mais parlez, parlez okay. lentement, s'il vous plaît, parce qu'il euh, y a... Okay, okay. ok, merci beaucoup. Je crois qu'elle vient de la Suisse, parce que la Suisse, c'est, c'est un pays multilingue, donc là-bas, ils utilisent aussi le français. En fait, ce, ce, séminaire, ce séminaire est très intéressant, parce que moi, je suis Pékin, je viens d'un pays, d'un continent qui a beaucoup souffert de la corruption de la part de notre gouvernement, des élites gouvernementaux. J'aimerais savoir pourquoi la Suisse reçoit ces fonds venant de cette euh, barbarie qu'on a tout en Afrique. Vous me comprenez Pourquoi la Suisse reçoit l'argent sale Parce que là-bas en Afrique, les présidents, les ministres, quand ils volent l'argent, ils l'amènent en Suisse, dans les paradis fiscaux. Vous voyez, même en Espagne. Vous comprenez Oui, j'ai compris. Ok, j'aimerais savoir pourquoi. Parce que quand on parle de la corruption, moi en tant qu'Africain, ça me fait mal. Même les Nations Unies, l'Union Européenne, la communauté internationale ne peut pas parler de la, de la corruption tout en favorisant la corruption. Moi en tant que président, je vole l'argent de mon pays, j'amène ça aux États-Unis, à New York, à Paris, en Bruxelles. Alors qu'ils sont là-bas, ils disent qu'ils sont là pour lutter contre la corruption. Mais ils favorisent cette pratique. Pourquoi J'aimerais savoir ça. Vous. Merci beaucoup. De rien. D'accord. Uh, la question est, la question est sur la corruption qui s'est passée dans son pays. Mais selon lui, la corruption de l'homme est en train de sauver son argent à Suisse. And how could that happen? So, if that happens, so what, what can yeah, the entire world or, or uh, specific actors can do to prevent this kind of co- uh, corruption activity? Uh, he thinks that it is yeah, beyond uh, his uh, understanding because uh, he thinks that it is not good. But why do people give uh, yeah, the uh, privilege yeah, to the Swiss bank to keep the money in, in that country? Yeah. No, this is a very good question. I mean, of course, Switzerland has been a successful banking center for centuries, uh, partly due because of the strict banking secrecy laws and traditions, which allow and have allowed, and uh, yeah, <laughs> to date, I'm sure there's still a lot of dirty money in there, So these laws have allowed uh, uh, kleptocrats from around the world to store their money in Switzerland. I I don't think anybody will contend with that. Um, Switzerland, as a result, has uh, come under heavy, heavy international pressure to revise the bank secrecy laws. And I know that they have. Um, I'm not a law scholar or a lawyer, so I cannot tell you from a professional assessment whether the reforms that have been passed are enough or not. That I I cannot tell you. I know that efforts are being made. I know that public opinion is very aware and there is pressure because it's also, of course, something that is um, uh, uh, dirtying the image of Switzerland. And, um, and, And what I also do know is that Like in, in our institute, like I said, there is a entire dedicated team that works on the, this topic. So we work routinely with the Swiss government and with the Swiss banks. And we have been part of efforts, for example, to successfully repatri- repatriate mon- stolen money from Swiss banks, um, for example, back to Peru. Um, The process is not easy because, you know, the, the, the corrupt are also not, not stupid. Huh? <laughs> so you probably will not find a single bank account that is under the name of President so Tra- So the process of tracing and unequivocally identifying stolen assets is a highly technical and complicated one. And it also requires a very strong collaboration 
between the authorities in the, um, in the um, receiving and the um, country that has lost the money, which is not a given. I mean, I, I think and I want to think that Switzerland, when it receives these requests for uh, looking into uh, financial transactions, uh, is cooperating. But like I said, the money, it has to be established to be coming from a corrupt source. Um, then it has to be frozen. Then th there's a long, long process that has to t t take place. And there's also the question of repat repatriation, which is a highly debated one. Because Switzerland, as well as you know, Cayman Islands and all of these um, uh, havens, um, and the international community in general, nobody wants to see recovered assets being sent back to the originating country and being stolen again, <laughs> right? So then the question of, okay, now we have these this assets that ha we know have been stolen from Guinea-Bissau. Hypothetical case, huh? but we have them, we have frozen them, we're confiscated them, we're ready to send them back. To whom? I don't know nothing about your country, apologies. You have to forgive me for that. So I don't know if, if your government, if you would trust your government with being given this money back without any strings attached. I, I just don't know. I know there are many countries where there are questions that the money is just going to go back into this cycle of corruption. So it's, it's, it's a really good question and it's a really incredibly difficult answer, I think, because it's, it's, it's technical, it's political, it's, it's, it takes a lot of time. Yeah, I hope I answered your question. And we have final questions from one person. Is there any qu final questions? Okay. Um, okay. Is, is my voice clear? Okay. Uh, introduce myself. My name is Arthur Leningrad. I'm from International Relation. And, and I would like to ask the question like, uh, later in, pre uh, in presentation, that it said that how, um, one of the challenge for the good governance happen it's half-hearted gender empowerment, empowerment that causes hinder inclusive governance. Well, we can agree that it's quite patriarchal. It's happened because patriarchal, which has become a strong enough culture because of its existence from the past, past thing like uh, equality will never be achieved. The question is how to conduct good governance of the country. I mean, like we can agree that I mean to erase a culture from the society is not that easy. Then the question is how to achieve this equality among patriarchal country, for example, in Indonesia itself. Thank you. Uh, I think your question is not really clear. Will you make it more clear, perhaps, <laughs> once again? Yeah. Can, can you take off? Your mask? Yeah. Yeah. So sorry. Okay. Is this clear? Yeah. Okay. 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 Um, okay. Um, so the question that I would like to ask, uh, I, I quite agree that before that one of the challenge that happened uh, to make the good clean and governance happen is half-hearted gender empowerment that caused hinder inclusive governance. For example, that it's happened it quite uh, patriarchal, which has become a strong enough culture because of the accession from the past. Things like that equality will never issue from that country, for example, uh, from the very first place. Then I would like to ask the question is, I mean, how to conduct good governance of the country if the equality principle never happened from that from from this country? Like I mean, like you know, to erase the culture from the society is not that easy. Then how to achieve this equality among patriarchy country? Thank you. Um, interesting um, question actually and that's concerned me as well yeah <laughs> it concerned me as well 
So how serious is the country to tackle this kind of, you know, uh, gender gap? Yeah. How serious government uh, in, you know, um, reducing the gap? Yeah. Strengthening the rep uh, women representation. Yeah. Uh, increasing women political participation. So we know that affirmative actions, we already have that kind of policy. But we can see, yeah, perhaps you also witness, it's not effectively, you know, strengthen women uh, in political arena. Yeah, uh, we have, I think uh, this, uh, this uh, elections, we do have 20%, never achieve 30%. In fact, uh, in local government levels, it's worse. Yeah, between 12 or 13 uh, percent women uh, representatives. So uh, that's why I treat that as a challenge. Yeah, that uh, challenge, serious challenge, to do good governance. If we want have like participative, you know, meaningful participation of all. Uh, people, regardless, you know, gender, regardless uh, ethnic or everything, include inclusive process. Then we need to tackle this kind of problem first. So affirmative actions, from my perspective, is not enough. We need like extraordinary policy, yeah, to make Indonesian women especially in this case, to have a same starting line, yeah, to, to be able to uh, actively involve in uh, po political arena. Yeah, if we want to have effective democracy, yeah, if we want to have effective government, then we need to involve yeah, all groups yeah, in community. Um, that's challenge. So we'll see, because sometimes we want to improve the uh, affirmative actions by using the zip, zipper system in the election. Like um, every three candidates, there will be one, uh, one uh, women candidates. But then it is annulled by the Supreme Court. Yeah. Uh, well, exactly. This is. This is a kind of challenge that faced by Indonesian women. So that's why when we talk about the practice of good governance, what kind of result we get. So that's why it's, I'm not like a skeptical, we still have the bright side, but we need to have more power to, you know, uh, to strengthen uh, or to empower women uh, more, uh, more powerful, I think. Yeah. Okay. Your turn. Can I maybe just just to complement uh, on, on on the answer to this question, um, because following on this theme, I, I agree that without proper equity is very difficult and to me this also includes income inequality because when you have people you know such large percentage of people that are desperately poor we cannot ask them to be responsible citizens i mean this i is my personal opinion it's 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 a brutal truth but i think it's it, it, it's it's really what we see that the poor are regularly manipulated during election time. Uh, votes are bought, you know, with money. There is no policy, there is no ideology, and also there is no accountability, you know? And, and, and I, I understand that, you know, if you have problems putting food on the table on a day-to-day -day basis, you don't have time to spend your days dreaming about, am I a liberal, am I a socialist, and you know, you, 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 if somebody comes and offers you money, you're going to take it, end of story. So, we don't have a citizenry, a strong citizenry that can hold the leaders accountable. So, I think that, um, 
I cannot give you the answer of how to get out of this situation, but um, unless we reach a um, level of where the living conditions of the population are allowing people to really become an ex-citizens, exercise their democratic rights, to me it's, it's very difficult uh, that we are going to break out of these cycles because in the end, we need to hold these people accountable who are in government. And, and, and I think that absolutely each and every one of the good governance definitions you showed us, I think the democracy, public participation, and, and that doesn't exist when people are so poor, so vulnerable, and the vote doesn't count for anything. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Dr. Camargo. And uh, it seems like uh, we have uh, many questions in a row. Uh, one more question from the... Uh, uh, actually, before her uh, raising hands, uh, I have already had this kind of question. Uh, I'm sorry, you just wait there for a while. Okay, I think uh, you're going to be the final. <laughs> okay, the, the final one, okay? And uh, this is a question from Abdul Basir Hamidi from Afghanistan, and he is pursuing his master degree at UNPAD too. And the, this question goes to Miss Claudia. As you know, the condition in countries that face to uh, facing the corruption in the meantime have also faced civil war issues in different and they have to put in practice many measures to deal with corruption. In your perspective, what is the best way of coping against corruption in a country uh, which is under conflict? Well, first of all, to take it seriously, um, because I, I think that one of the biggest risks when you're emerging out of a conflict situation is that it's very tempting to um, forge alliances for the sake of stability, uh, but on, on, on the basis of questionable deals. And um, I think that, I mean, there's of course this very famous book by Sarah Chase on, on the case of Afghanistan and, and how corruption became a system um, that goes along these lines and, and was corruption while it was eating the system at the same time it was keeping the system together, you know, as, as paradoxical as it sounds. Um, and in that book she is pretty much blaming the US for not giving the right um, priority to issues of corruption and focusing just on training military and, and, and that kind of thing. And, um, and, and I think the lesson learned is that corruption has to be taken seriously from the beginning because then otherwise there's a very high risk that corruption becomes the system. And then once that's happened, it's really difficult to get out of that. Yeah. Thank you, uh, Dr. Camargo. And this is your, your opportunity. Test. Okay, thank you for the opportunity, ma'am. Uh, my name is Anneke Zehan. Um, honestly, I just want to um, continue my friend's question. Uh, you can answer it with only yes or no. With this, patri with this patriarchal society, is it possible to make good and clean governance happen in here, in Indonesia? Thank you. With this patriarchal society, is it possible to make this good and clean governance happen here? Yes or no, Prof. Moody? Thank you. Uh, my dear, no, of course not. Of course not. Absolutely not. Jadi harus selesai, Bu. Okay, it's the... Make this patriarchal society gone. Oh, God. God. <laughs> Okay, thank you, ma'am. I think, yeah, yeah, right. And perhaps, Pak uh, Widya, we need more uh, hybrid uh, seminar, yeah, to to talk about this one <laughs> because it's very interesting. <laughs> but uh, you know, uh, ladies and gentlemen, we are. I'm so sorry to say that we are in the end of the session. 
And I'm very uh, appreciate your coming on this panel, Dr. Camargo and Dr. Mudiati Rahmatunisa, um, to share your vast experience and knowledge yeah, on good clean and clean governance. And uh, thank you uh, so much for all attendees, ladies and gentlemen, for your active participation uh, and uh, during the discussion session and during this hybrid seminar. And I hope this forum will give you more insightful understanding particularly on good and clean governance. Uh, good afternoon. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. And I send it back to the Master of Ceremony. in today's webinar and for that I would like to thank the respected speakers and moderator. To show our biggest gratitude, we have prepared some gifts for Bayes Institute of Governance. Bapak Widya boleh membantu memberikan uh, hadiahnya. Yeah. 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 Yeah.